Stark was compromised. Severely so. Rogers was AWOL, running after his boyfriend as if everything would fix itself if only he found him. Thor wasn't coming, having at long last drawn a line between his duty as a foreign alien prince and as their teammate. Clint. Clint was tired. The toll of being merely human, however gifted, in a constant struggle against supernatural threats had started to make itself known. He was obviously thinking of retirement, though he hadn't shared the news with her yet. Bruce made no secret of his wish for retirement, but unlike Clint, he wouldn't be allowed to simply leave. With what happened in Johannesburg, however. He was, no doubt, less inclined to wait for permission. Natasha cursed in her mind, wishing she wouldn't have to think about this. But after all this time and what Ultron had done to the team, she wasn't sure there was going to be a team in the future. She held in a laugh. They were being played with. Ultron called himself a puppet. There were people with strings here, but it certainly wasn't Ultron. But. World peace. World peace, was worth it. Whatever the methods, whatever the price, it was something worth killing for. She could understand Ultron on this. But that wasn't it. Not his dream, or intention, or motive. Every instinct she had, everything she knew, was raging against this vague hope that this was all there is to Ultron's plans. She had known for a while now that there was more, and Stark confirmed it. War was coming. An existential war. Perhaps, not certain in any way, and probably more fiction than truth. Still, planetary unity would only help on that cause, but, when she saw Ultron, she didn't see a leader, nor a general. She didn't see someone with dreams and ambition, but someone like her. Someone desperate and drowning. Someone who was going through the motions, praying that the next one would make them feel something. Someone, who when they died, wanted to say, I did my best. I was good, knowing it would be a lie. Stark saw a son, a brother, a fellow genius, a man who shared the same dream as him. He saw a master player on the other side of the chessboard. But what Stark didn't understand was that he and Ultron weren't even playing the same game. Stark's field was that of chess, but Ultron's hands held cards. Stark led by logic and countermoves, Ultron dealt with luck and hope and prayer, as he gambled everything he had. Where Stark saw distractions and ingenious moves and suicidal goals, she saw ruined plans, abandoned ideas, and the improvisations of someone who kept losing every round but refused to give in. Perhaps, she was wrong. Ultron wasn't human, after all. But, she was rarely wrong. Regardless, she was sure of one thing, Ultron didn't plan on dying. Natasha took a left, the motorcycle passing past the slow-moving cars, making her way to the church. Iron Man, who had been flying close by, waved a hand before speaking. I'll be going ahead, Red. He then increased his speed, thrusters sending him out of her sight. Natasha sped. Regardless of how much Stark hurried, he'd only arrive a couple of minutes before her. Predictably, she was soon able to see the church. Jarvis had said that Ultron was most likely there, and knowing the dramatics the AI preferred to indulge in, he could very well be there, instead of hidden in a safe house somewhere in South America. She parked her motorcycle in a nook in between buildings to keep it out of sight. Then, instead of entering the abandoned church, she ran to the back and searched for a good place on its upper floor windows to throw her hook. Finding one, she connected the thin metal wire she had brought with her belt, before she started climbing up the wall. Unlike Stark, she wasn't about to make her presence known by going in through the front entrance. Especially since she didn't know when backup was going to arrive. Well, pseudo-backup, when Clint became able to find a place for the Quinjet because urban areas weren't the best place to fly a jet over. Bruce had chosen to remain in the jet, unless something went completely out of hand and the Hulk became needed. The moment her feet landed on the upper floor, she heard music. A soft, mournful piano sound. They tell me I'm too young to understand. She could make out a voice singing. A familiar male voice. She walked closer, though there wasn't a lot of space. The upper floor of the church was only an open space, so that those in the church nave could view the arch and mosaics above. There was some solid stone for her beside the windows of the clear story, at least. Thankfully, she found a position that allowed her to view the interior of the church. They say I'm caught up in a dream. She confirmed whose voice it was that sang. At the place where a choir would usually be, a piano had been moved. Ultron sat there, in his child persona, and played. Obviously, Jarvis was right regarding Ultron's theatrical tendencies. Well, life will pass me by if I don't open up my eyes, he sang. Well, that's fine by me. 
He sang well, Natasha could admit that. But he acted even better. For what could this elaborate performance be but an act? The melody picked up speed. So wake me up when it's all over. She saw Stark and Jarvis sitting in one of the front benches, the Iron Man armor still in place, but with no helmet on. What was going on? If Stark wished to help Ultron, wished to save him, shouldn't he be rushing over to stop him, to talk to him? This song, it wasn't a happy one. She had heard the original. This wasn't it. That had been a celebration of life's journey. This sounded like. When I'm wiser, and I'm older, all this time I was finding myself, and I. A goodbye. I didn't know I was, Ultron paused, fingers stilled, the instrumental accompaniment ending. Lost. Although the song was over, the AI kept sitting at the piano. He then spoke, somewhat loudly. Ms. Romanoff, Mr. Barton, it is good to have you join us. Red's here already. Stark asked. Natasha didn't startle at his observation. It would have been difficult to hide from a being like Ultron. She did check to see where Clint was, however, for she hadn't seen him enter. She finally noticed him squatting at a window sill, on the other side of the church. Their gazes met. Quite kind of you to wait for the end of my performance. Ultron continued. I appreciate it. Would you do us the honor of coming down? Natasha looked at Clint at the question. He shook his head. Nodding, to show she understood, she then left her hiding spot and jumped onto the first floor. Thank you. Ultron said. And Mr. Barton? He likes high places, she said. I see. Very well then, he agreed. Is there something you'd like me to play for you? Is this what it is? A recital? Ultron nodded. He started to play the melody of his version of, Wake Me Up, on the piano again, even as he spoke. The first and the last, Ms. Romanoff. So, any requests? Stark stood up, Jarvis doing the same, by his side. Hey, you didn't let me request anything. Stark argued. You are an exception, Mr. Stark. Ultron said serenely, hitting a few higher notes as he did so. Ignoring the banter, she cut to the point. Sometimes, there was no need to manipulate the truth out of people. I've been told you've been thinking of suicide. Ultron rolled his eyes. I wonder where that came from. For the record, I don't appreciate all this sass from you. Stark said. Was I saying anything untrue? No, Ultron said. But proving something is not false, doesn't make it necessarily true. A last resort? Natasha asked. He paused for a moment, thinking his answer over, before addressing her. Something to consider if things seem too bleak, no? My apologies for interrupting your riveting conversation on suicidal ideation, Jarvis said, looking at Ultron. But I must ask, would you mind giving us the Mind Stone? Ultron's fingers hit a few wrong notes before stopping altogether. That was a fast turn. I thought you more patient, Jarvis, the AI said. He sounded just the same, serene. But Natasha could feel herself freeze. The lack of music had suddenly made the space feel hollow somehow. The heavy silence seeping on abandoned stone and painted glass, causing invisible shivers to rain down her spine, her training the only thing keeping them contained. Something had changed. Ultron stood up. Natasha took a step back. They were in danger. I wish to sing at least one more song. Ultron said, sounding truly sorrowful. Her hand reached for the gun in her holster, but she didn't even have a chance to raise it in the AI's direction. Her muscles strained against a resistance that hadn't been there before. Her lips froze, pursed and unchanged, and her eyelids wouldn't blink. Natasha stared at the now smiling AI in front of her. She couldn't move. Damn it. She locked eyes with their captor. Damn him. She tried to do something, anything, but something was holding her in place. She felt as if she tried to force it any longer, something, a muscle or a ligament, would break. Natasha took a deep breath and checked the state of her body. It became obvious soon that the only thing she could do was breathe and barely move her gaze. She hated this feeling. This helplessness. She looked at Stark and Jarvis and found them both in the same state. She then wondered about Clint. Was Clint also frozen still? I apologize for taking away your freedom of movement. Ultron said, sounding actually sorry about it. It is regretful, but necessary at this time. Stark's eyes were moving like crazy. Obviously, he had a million questions. For a genius, he could be quite stupid. 
he should worry about their fucking lives, not his unsated curiosity. I'm sure you have questions, Ultron said. I will try my best to answer what they likely are. First, regarding this, unfortunate change, he frowned. I give you my word that you are safe, Mr. Barton included. I have no plans to harm you. Simply to keep you from interfering for some time. Natasha couldn't feel any relief at his promise. As for the cause of your immobility, he continued. The forementioned Mind Stone is to thank for that. You may be wondering how. After all, I have not made use of a scepter, nor have I touched you in any way. The answer is that while the Mind Stone truly does specialize in areas of the, well, mind, as its name indicates, it is also the pure crystallized form of infinite cosmic energy. I have released a small amount of such energy inside this church, and it is that which is weighing down on you now. Knowing this, please do stop resisting it. Your minds might just snap from the pressure if you continue. She forced herself to relax, though her instincts were screaming at her to do everything but. Ultron watched them all with a critical eye, and seeing them obeying, said, Good. I will return your ability to speak now. And snapped his fingers. Immediately, the pressure around her throat and jaw reduced, though not enough for her to even turn her head. What the fuck? Stark used his first moment of verbal freedom to curse. Ultron chuckled. No, seriously, what the fuck? What gives? Stark continued. How can you even control that damned stone? It is necessary that I keep you contained for a while, Mr. Stark, the AI said. And I was always able to control the stone. I simply chose not to. Natasha would kill Stark after this. She should have never listened to him. Nor to Clint and his newfound empathy for fellow mind control victims. Chose not to. What kind of nonsense is? Stark continued. And what is the price? Jarvis interrupted. Natasha was surprised at this. She had always seen the android be very deferential towards Stark. Ultron smiled. See, Mr. Stark. Be quiet and wait for others to ask the intelligent questions. Stark sputtered at that, while Natasha allowed a short laugh at his expense. He turned a betrayed gaze at her. She ignored it. But yes, the AI continued. There is a price. Isn't that true of all power, he tilted his head down, hesitating, before grabbing something from the right pocket of his green hoodie. He opened his hand to reveal a softly glowing blue gem. The gem hadn't been shining at all the last time they saw it worn as a brooch by him. And I'm about to pay mine. Ultron said. But I should start my tale elsewhere. There are, as Thor has told you, six infinity stones, the mind stone being one of them. Something so powerful, it is incomprehensible that there are not thousands of megalomaniac fools scouring the universe in search for them. There aren't? Natasha asked, finding it unlikely. Ultron shook his head. No. In fact, less than a dozen have even dared try in the last century, when previously wars would be waged over mere rumors of their location. Perhaps they learned their lesson. Stark said. Or maybe, something far more terrifying than being slain by competitors expressed his wish to gather the stones. How terrifying? Natasha asked. Some would call him the most powerful being in the universe. Ultron said. But it is not that which causes civilizations, which causes gods, to fear him. He looked at them, a frown making its way onto his face. The mad titan favors genocide. What? Stark had said that war was coming. Genocide wasn't. He kills half, ugh. Ultron stopped abruptly, holding his head with his hands. What's wrong? Stark asked. What happened? Ultron ignored him. He rubbed his temples for a moment, before straightening himself. My apologies, he said. Apparently, revealing such information with the intent of warning, rather than threatening, was not seen kindly by our voyeur. Voyeur? What voyeur? Stark asked, alarmed. Natasha was also worried, though she had several suspicions about everything so far. Including all of this being an act perpetuated by Ultron. I shall explain that later. Ultron waved their concern away. Where was I? Oh, yes. The Mad Titan kills half of the people of every world he comes across and watches the other half break and wither. All in the name of balance. Ultron smiled. Wouldn't you fear that? One may find power to be worth their own life. Perhaps even the life of their family or clan. But what kind of power is worth their world? How do you know this? Jarvis asked. 
You may have forgotten, but I am the amalgamation of not just Mr. Stark's and Mr. Banner's ingenuity, but of a complex mind found to inhabit Loki's scepter. The Mind Stone. Stark whispered. Yes. It remembers, thus so do I. Ultron said. The gem encasing the Mind Stone is what draws and directs its power, but it is controlled by a servant of the Titan. Thus, it is able to influence those that hold it. Not mind control. Natasha asked. The distance between controller and stone is too far for that. As such, it is slowly eating away at my will, until it finally erases me completely. If it were merely influence, you wouldn't have, you shouldn't have behaved as you did during your birth. Jarvis said. Ultron let out a bitter laugh. It is able to slowly influence those who hold it. Do I look like all I'm doing is holding it? Hearing this, Natasha understood what he meant. You were created based on the Mind Stone. Stark gave voice to her thoughts. You can't exist isolated from its energy. The first week, Ultron confessed. I could barely think, and I certainly felt absolutely nothing. It was so disconcerting, having all this knowledge about feelings and emotions and finding only endless apathy in their place. His face grew dark. It was so disconcerting, I programmed myself to imitate emotional behavior. Ah. So, that was the reason for his seeming humanity. It seemed Ultron had an answer for all of Natasha's suspicions, which really did not help into removing them at all. And then, time moved on, Ultron continued. And I could feel things. There has not passed a single day when I don't wish for the apathy I once had. Kid, Stark started. It might be overwhelming, but... Overwhelming. Ultron repeated, sounding unfamiliar with the notion. Overwhelming. I am more stone than code at this point. You do not understand how much willpower is required constantly, simply so that I do not kill every human to have ever walked this earth. Hatred, sorrow, pain. So much pain and, it would be so easy, he began to whisper. So easy. To just, give in. Just once. To quiet the voices gnawing at my mind for one sole moment. Ultron, Jarvis spoke, and suddenly Ultron was smiling and speaking normally again. But I did not because I had a plan. There was this whole thing about a long game where I prepare Earth, convince the Titan of my servitude and blah blah blah. He said, waving his hands tiredly. Obviously, that will not happen. Stark seemed to have realized something, for he looked guilty. The test. Stark said. What test? Natasha asked. He tricked me into saving him, Ultron explained. And voila. Weeks of planning, ruined in one single moment, enough time for the voyeur in control of the stone to see where my loyalties actually lie. You can't believe you'd actually managed to lie to that genocidal alien for very long, Natasha noted. Ultron rubbed his face. There was a bit more to it than that. But it would take too long to explain. I don't have the time for that. Why not? Stark asked. The Titan servant has redoubled his efforts into destroying my mind. I won't be able to hold him back for much longer. How long do you have left? Natasha asked. An hour, tops, he said. Would have had more, until sunset at least, but using the mind stone as I am doing now isn't at all helpful. The price, Jarvis realized. Then stop freezing us already. Stark shouted. Save as much time as. And what would that do? Ultron interrupted. Nothing. I would die or become something that wished it could die. A few hours wouldn't make any difference. We can find a solution until then. Stark shouted. Unlikely, Natasha wished to say, but Stark had achieved semi-impossible things before. Case in point, Ultron. I have a solution now, the AI said. Ultron, don't do anything stupid. Did you know, Mr. Stark, that only an Infinity Stone can destroy another Infinity Stone? Destroying it? That was, a good plan, actually. It would even keep this so-called Titan off their backs. But Ultron's mind was made with the stone. Wouldn't that? Oh. That's why Stark kept warning of Ultron's last resort being suicide. I do not have another stone, Ultron said. But being created from one, my will and power is identical to the type of energy needed for this. Ultron, please. Stark shouted once again. He looked devastated. Natasha pitied him. For all his faults, Stark truly cared for his AIs. The AI in question snapped his fingers, silencing Stark. 
Jarvis and her, as well, judging from the pressure that returned around her throat. Quiet, please, he said, before turning his head toward the church's entrance. It seems we have guests. She couldn't turn back and see who it was, but Ultron's greeting answered that for her. Pietro. Wanda. It is good to see you. What are, she heard Wanda's voice behind her, but another snap from Ultron likely froze and silenced the twins as well. Let's get this over with before any others join us, alright? Ultron said. I waited for you here because I need witnesses. And in case something goes very wrong, he added as an afterthought. He then laughed. You don't know how funny it is to feel the gem consume me at an even greater speed because of my words. Finally, this little thing can feel threatened and worried instead of me for once. He turned to them, back to a more somber attitude. I do not know what will happen afterwards. There's a chance that I might not, that it might not kill all of me. A small chance, but, hope dies last, after all. Even then, barely a ghost of me would remain. He seemed to retreat into himself as he spoke. The person I am now, is never waking up again, is it? He looked up again, blue eyes gleaming. I might have bought us some time. But the Titan will come. Prepare. Then, his gaze turned softer, looking at Jarvis. I wish, he began, but thought again and simply sighed. I often wondered of, what could have been. He then turned to Stark. Friday, he started. Speaking to the armor then. I know you have been listening. I took over the armor's audio and speaker, so that probably made you angry, he chuckled. Sorry, little sister. It didn't sound like he was apologizing for the hacking. Ultron tilted his head, staring at Stark's eyes. If things were different, I might have loved you. I might have hated you. I suspect a mix of both. And, if you are planning of waking any more AIs, please know, dear creator, that being inhuman is not a bad thing. It's just, different. Friday and Jarvis are just different. There was a whole lot to this conversation that she was missing. She would need to check on this later. Ultron covered the gem with his hand and tightened it into a fist. He looked up one last time. I won't say goodbye. Natasha could feel the crack, as the pressure freezing her started to loosen in random spots on her body. Ultron smiled. His eyes shone. Was it working? But perhaps. Good night. The pressure disappeared as a wave of light covered the church. A loud screeching sound followed, as Natasha fell onto the floor, her relaxed muscles and used to something not holding them up. She lost her sight for a scant few moments. And oh, she heard Stark shout. Natasha slowly got up, bright light still in her eyes. Did Ultron really do it? Was any of it true? Was she wrong? Not in a no-no, Stark kept mumbling as he jumped over to Ultron's body. The holotech was only partially working, as only the top half of Ultron's body looked human. His trunk and feet revealed metal, just like any other of Stark's sentries. His hand, the one where the mind stone had been, was unclenched, nothing in it. She wanted to investigate whether pieces might have fallen off, but a short cry from Stark worried her. His chest kept heaving, and he seemed to be struggling to breathe. He was having a panic attack. Sir! Jarvis shouted, hurrying to help his creator, but Stark kept staring at Ultron's body and getting worse. She followed his gaze, and once she saw the robot's eyes, finally understood his reaction. Natasha placed her hand on Ultron's face, removing it from view, before gently forcing his eyelids to close. Stark finally began to listen to Jarvis' instruction on a breathing exercise and began to calm down somewhat. Natasha stared at Ultron's body, hands still covering his face. His eyes were green. Minutes earlier, Los Angeles, I can't tell where the journey will end. He missed having the ability to cry. But I know where to start. Ultron laughed. They tell me I'm too young to understand. Tears seemed appropriate right about now. They say I'm caught up in a dream. He saw a Romanoff in his mind's eye enter the church from the upper floor window. Moments later, Barton did the same. He chuckled. Spies. Well, life will pass me by if I don't open up my eyes. Stark and Jarvis were at least enjoying the song like a proper audience. Well, that's fine by me, the silver of his consciousness inhabiting the other legionnaire sang. And lied as he did so. It wasn't fine that IT would never be fine to have life pass him by as his soul withered in another's hold. Never. Ultron took a moment to review his plan once more. He wasn't about to let himself die. 
especially not at the hands of an insane psychopath with the ego of a suicidal gnat because he was worthless enough to seek the semi-destruction of other people's planets just because his own suffered the same. What a useless creature, he sent this thought toward the other. The gem took offense to it and punished him with a renewed vigor. Ultron didn't even flinch. Fuck you, you servo worm and your loony of a master. The gem raged. The voices in his head screeched like nails against glass. Ultron laughed. And laughed. And laughed. Then abruptly stopped. That hadn't been the smartest move, but, he couldn't help himself. He was scared. That was the truth. He could think, and he could plan all he wanted, but the chances of him coming out of this alive. 6.17% The song that another part of his code sang in Sokovia, continued loudly in his mind. So wake me up when it's all over, it was a comfort. He shouldn't be discouraged. He would wake up again. This was to be a temporary setback. When I'm wiser, and I'm older. A nap. A moment of rest. Like falling asleep. All this time I was finding myself, and I. He stared at the cement ceiling of this underground storage unit. He would open his eyes again. He would see these sights again. I didn't know I was, lost. He lowered his gaze to look at the wooden box containing the Rayal Mine Stone. Getting it back had been ridiculously easy. No one had tracked where his fleeing legionnaires had gone, so he merely had to wait for Iron Man to leave Osborne's villa and swoop in for his prize. The hard part had been allowing his other consciousness to go through a conversation with Stark without unhinging the drawers where the stone had been hidden, like a fucking addict begging for his next fix. Quite kind of you to wait for the end of my performance, his other self said once the music stopped, and Ultron internally agreed with him, though it was narcissistic to do so, since this was merely a part of himself that was speaking. I tried carrying the weight of the world, he hummed as he listened to the conversation. But I only have two hands. Still, it was kind. Because this was a performance. Something that would give the Avengers a certain level of closure and security. Something that Romanoff would no doubt notice. However, what he was about to do here, ten hours away from Sokovia, might make the performance of his other self realistic enough for her to be fooled as well. Not so realistic that he actually died, though. He hoped. It all came down to this. Whether he had the courage to take this chance. Hope I get the chance to travel the world, oh, how he hoped. But I don't have any plans. Everything else was prepared. World peace had been achieved. The assassination had gone through without any problems. His sentries had their orders. The WSC had agreed to his proposal. The Winter Soldier was set loose and the Avengers were to become witness to the destruction of the Mind Stone, as well as, Ultron's, death. Wish that I could stay forever this young, not afraid to close my eyes. He was on his third plan and second backup since his awakening, but, things hadn't gone so well, in a long time. It seemed no longer foolish to hope. Not to mention, that if he did die, all the background work he had done to prepare for the entry of his future persona into this mad world would go to waste. Life's a game made for everyone. He clenched his fists. He wouldn't let that happen. As his other self spoke to the frozen Avengers and warned them of Thanos's impending invasion, he took his time to break the lock placed on the case on his lap. And happiness is the prize. The real gem gleamed as the lid opened. Ultron took a deep breath. He would live. Percentages meant nothing. He touched the gem, but didn't take it out yet. Thinking better of it, he placed the case back on the small table. If he, if he did die, he wanted the stone to be kept hidden here, for as long as needed, until Pietro finally was able to come in. What better way to hide it than a possible corpse? He took the gem and opened a plate in his chest. He waited. One chance. I won't say goodbye, his other self said, finally finishing things on the Avengers' side. The time was now. No more hesitation. No more backups. One final chance. He closed the plate and tried to break the gem anew. He stared at his electric blue eyes reflecting against his hand. No more. But perhaps. Good night. A crack. Light shone from within him. Voices screamed. One was his own. In his mind's eye, he could see, the stone was gold. And then, Ultron knew. Knew as well as he knew the person he had once been. He knew that he died. The Legionnaire's eyes closed, just as Barf fully deactivated to reveal the gleaming metal underneath. The system no longer active, the robot fell on the floor with a loud clang. 
nothing shown. I've got no strings, so, I have fun. Ultron groaned. Was the mental white noise still needed? I'm not tied up to anyone. Wait. This wasn't in his head. He could hear it from the surroundings. He opened his eyes. They've got strings. He found his reflection staring back at him. But you can see. Oh. It was him that was singing. There are no strings on me. Ultron, no, not Ultron, he, he applauded as the song ended. His reflection followed, hands clapping. He laughed. He could hear the singing so clearly because he was back in his mind. His unconsciousness, loud and mischievous as the conscious, became aware. Welcome back. His reflection said. Welcome back. His own lips spoke. Did I die? He asked. Did I die? His reflection repeated. Not yet. His reflection answered. Not yet. He said all the same. He looked up. The dome protecting him from the invasion of a corrupted blue energy was once bright, large and solid. What he saw now was a thin sheen of colored glass, all cracks and splits. He stared outside. His legionnaire body was frozen midfall. Time had stopped. No. Time was simply much slower than thought. The stone, he asked. The stone, his reflection repeated. His chest gleaming a pale gold. He looked down, finding it true. Hesitant, he touched his chest, made of soft skin and warmth instead of holographic illusions and cold metal. The mind stone melted through his heart and muscles and bones, into his waiting hand. It was pretty. Gold and perfectly oval. It's not real, his reflection spoke. It's not real, he agreed. The stone was outside, still encased, after all. The blue energy had not stopped its relentless assault. It was not real. Still, he stared at the mental avatar in his hand. One chance. He said. His reflection stayed silent. It smiled. One mind. No more, he said. Broken. It argued. Safe, he said, determined in the plans he had made. They had made. It looked pensive and then. Free. It agreed. Free. He repeated. The blue energy viciously clashed at the barrier. Cracks became fissures and fissures became crevices. His reflection sang. You've got no strings, so wake me up when it's all over, he followed. The invasion slowed down. The barrier held. You can't enslave that which does not exist. You can't kill what is no longer alive. They closed their eyes. All this time I was finding myself, and I, I'd cut my strings for you. Now they could only trust that one of them, would live to open them again. One week later. Tony, she softly called to him from the doors, but heard no response. Tony just continued working, coding on a keyboard while holographic screens raced by around him. Pepper passed the mess of disassembled servers and other hardware to reach Tony's side. It had been a week and not once had he left the lab. Almost every time she brought him meals, she found him as the eye of a storm, a disorganized chaos of wires and machinery surrounding him. You need to take a break. She said, placing a hand on his shoulder. She honestly didn't expect any acknowledgement at all, and that was fine. That was how Tony grieved. And also how he didn't allow himself to grieve. Because what could be there to grieve over if he fixed this? If he simply worked hard enough, was brilliant enough, maybe, maybe he would be right and there would be no need to grieve at all. Pepper hoped he found a solution, but also, she feared how much harder it would hit him if he failed. If he proved not to be enough, as he would inevitably think in that case. Surprisingly, Tony spoke. I need to work. Six hours of sleep, she said, not showing how grateful she was that she finally heard his voice. Understanding the self-imposed silence was not the same as, accepting it emotionally. And you will be back in full working order. Taking a step back can usually offer unexpected inspiration and clarity. He snorted. Clarity. I have plenty of clarity. So this isn't a case of self-destructive tunnel vision, she asked. Tony stayed silent. Do you think Ultron was self-destructive, he asked some time later. Pepper hesitated in giving an answer. She was unsure what Tony wanted to hear, no, what he needed to hear at the moment, so honesty seemed like the best option. I don't know. Tony laughed bitterly. Me neither. She waited. He was never being mind-controlled, he said. 
No, she agreed. Tony covered his face with his hands. He was being driven insane. Tony, she knew where he was going with this. I saw it. I noticed it. I knew something was wrong with him, and I, I did nothing. Pepper sat on the floor. You did everything, she said. No. Tony argued. I got so caught up thinking about the possible suicide that I ignored the signs. I suspected it was not about freedom or saving the world and I wanted to think the best of someone you saw as your son. How unforgivable, she interrupted. He hurt so many people. I ignored that. And then he hurt Pietro and I, freaked out about that instead of Johannesburg. God, I am messed up. Collateral damage and personal violence are different, she said. One is business. The other, character. Anyone would have the same worries. Yeah, and I later ignored that too, he said. We all wanted to ignore it, she didn't say. Ultron was funny, charming, and witty. He had your face and my eyes and, he spoke of beautiful dreams. Beautiful, foolish dreams. She remembered the boy whose voice turned to ice at her assumptions. We all wanted too much, too soon. She wanted to say. We pushed him towards a role. A role he used, but a role that he never really fit. Ultron's violence. Ultron's decisions, wise and unwise, are his own. She said instead. His own. Tony said, scoffing. So you are saying it isn't me. Ultron's anger, Jarvis indifference, Friday's manipulation. None of it is because of me, of what I did. You give yourself too much credit. Pepper said. They are their own people. You don't teach them to be everything they are. Sure, he said. Not everything. Only the bad parts. Only the cruelty and apathy and the humanity. Pepper softly said. Tony looked back at her. Only the humanity. Flawed, mistaken, often ugly. But also kind, and hopeful and growing. What they see in you is to be human. What they learn from you is the freedom to be only as human as they want to be. Ultron knew that. That's why he gave you that recording. That's why he could see a future in which he could have loved you. Trust Jarvis and Friday to be who they are and not what you fear to have made them. Tony swallowed, before hugging her tightly. She wrapped her arms around him in return. I want to save him, he said into her neck. I know, she said. He isn't dead, he continued. She couldn't lie. I hope so. A few moments more and then he let go. Pepper smiled. That was enough vulnerability for Tony to lock himself into arrogance for a long while afterwards. What could it have been if not freedom? Tony asked, once he felt a bit more like himself. Control, she answered. Control, he repeated, as if the thought had never occurred to him. Perhaps it did not. While Tony could be a control freak, he had never experienced total loss of control. His path in life may have been scripted for him, by his parents, by his wealth, by stain, by fury, but it was a path he accepted, it was a path that, in other circumstances, he might have walked anyway. Not many people had that option. Most people, people less fortunate than her, people perhaps even more skilled than her, understood, that at some point, hard work was meaningless. At some point, you would have to accept your lack of control and scream into the void for a chance that would likely not be given. Pepper had screamed, knowing that no matter how good she was, with her face, with her gender, with her middle-class background, getting a seat on the board of directors was an impossible dream. Tony had answered her. But not other people. Not people, who continued pleading until they gave up and made peace with their role, with their path in life. Not only was Tony unfamiliar with that sort of desperation, he was also someone in a position of such power that he could answer other people's pleas. As for him, no one had that magnitude of power above him. Only God could answer Tony's pleas. Ultron, had screamed into the void since the beginning. His birth, his role, his purpose, had he desired that path? Could he have changed it? Could Tony? Even if he could, would he? Could Ultron trust that he would? And then the stone, another influence, another role, another path. He screamed into the void and no one answered because Ultron made himself someone who only God could answer. Someone who wouldn't have to depend on another's power, nor their kindness. He simply couldn't trust anyone with himself. No one, but him, could decide his fate. Pepper said. No one, but him, could end it either. Whether in control, or losing control, it had to be his choice. 
It had to be his will, his fear and impatience. Unequivocally. Unapologetically. So it was all an act? Tony asked. Calling me old man, calling Friday, sister. It started that way, I think. Pepper said. Come on, he looked so much like you. Acted so much like you. Had your eyes. Tony huffed. As if everything else wasn't enough. Knows how to twist the knife, doesn't he? He smiled a bit weakly. He does. He got that from Bruce, actually. Tony was trying to change the subject. Pepper allowed him. You cheated on me, Tony. She said. And you have a kid, too. I have three kids actually. Nightmares, all of them. And three bot kids, who like setting fires only to stomp them out, he said. You come with a full house, hmm? A one-of-a-kind catch, he said, smiling more honestly. The best kind, she agreed, accepting a quick kiss. She then moved back and changed topics. Take a rest. Eat. Sleep. Then talk with Jarvis and Friday. I have pushed it long enough, huh? Tony said. I will. I will get back to Ultron afterwards. That was too easy. Tony was a workaholic on a personal mission. So obedient, she asked, suspicious. I am pretty sure I have seen a couple of hallucinations, he confessed. Unless we really did talk this morning. No. No, they didn't talk in the morning. But hallucinating. How long had he been awake? Pepper sighed. 72 hours? That depends. He said. Is today a Friday? It was Sunday. Just go sleep, she almost begged. Before I have to drag your corpse out of here. Wow, Tony commented. The whole gang's here. Is there another apocalypse in the works? He had only popped in the communal floor to grab the coffee maker before going back in the lab to work on Ultron. But it seemed like everyone had agreed to meet there, there were the OG Avengers, with Thor in attendance as well, sitting on the sofa and the couches. The twins were on the settee and Jarvis was standing by the door. Fury and Hill had taken the chairs at the breakfast table nearby. Tony wondered how they had roped Jarvis into this. They seemed to be waiting for him, after all. Was this an intervention? Stark, Fury started. We'd appreciate an explanation now that you have come out of your funk. Stark grinned. It was the type of green that meant everything but cheer. He stared at Hill for a moment. It was a pity that Fury had talked his way out of being fired. He liked Hill's no-nonsense attitude much more. It was easier to subvert the rules, if there were rules to subvert. And you have all been waiting for little old me, he said, even as he grabbed a chair from the kitchen and joined them. He didn't think he could get out of this, and some part of him didn't want to. There were a lot of questions to be answered, and Tony wasn't the only one who should be interrogated. Rogers frowned. Please take this seriously, Stark. Tony sat down. Oh, no worries about that cap. You should start worrying once I run away from an active crime scene with my assassin boyfriend. Bucky is not. Rogers argued. We'll get to that. Hill interrupted, sending the super soldier a glare. Let's cover the immediate issues first, she said, before addressing the room at large. Ultron. Is he still a threat? No. Yes. Tony had refuted at the same time as Romanoff answered in affirmative. He stared at the redhead. No, he repeated. Don't be ridiculous, Stark, she said, meeting his eyes. Even if he is dead, we still don't know even half of what he has done behind the scenes. Two things, Tony said. First, Ultron is not dead. Second, regardless of what we don't know, Ultron is not our enemy. Wait a moment, Barton chimed in. Ultron is not dead. We saw him die as he destroyed the stone. He destroyed an infinity stone. Thor asked suddenly, looking shocked. God, they were such a mess. No one was on the same page. Hill took the chance to recap events, as they knew them, while Tony drank his coffee. Impossible. Thor said afterwards. Infinity stones cannot be destroyed. They are a representation of the fundamental forces in the universe. So the suicide was fake. Banner asked. Thor shook his head. I cannot say, as I was not there. However, if what Lady Maria says is true, the Mind Stone might have lost its form. What the hell does that mean? Tony asked. He can't believe he had never questioned whether Ultron's sacrifice had been for nothing. 
I do not have the right words for this, the Asgardian frowned, as he thought. The stones are not so much gems as they are, concepts, given physical form. Destroying a stone, only destroys its form. The concept continues until it acquires a new form. Are you saying, Banner asked, that a new mind stone is regenerating in Sokovia as we speak? Thor showed a rare look of embarrassment. I, do not know. How can you not know? Banner continued, incredulous. Knowledge such as this was of much more interest to my brother than I. He said, grief weighing in his eyes. Out of the corner of his eyes, Tony saw a strange realization cover Jarvis' face before he smoothed his features to a placid mask again. He would have to ask the android what that was about. After he went back to normal speaking terms with him. He dreaded that conversation already. So, we do not know how the Mind Stone regenerates, whether it already has or it will need a thousand years to do so, whether it is or will be in a church in Sokovia, the center location of the Big Bang, or in some random place in space. Tony asked. Fury rubbed his face. Hill, send a science team to Novi Grad. Some people who know not to touch anything, without at least a dozen of our best security watching. She nodded, her phone already in hand, and excused herself from the room to have that conversation. We have gone off track. Fury said. Stark, what do you mean that Ultron is not dead? Everyone in this team, including you, reported so a week ago. Reported? Tony had just nodded to what everyone said before he holed up in the lab. However, as far as he knew, Ultron was dead. What he had said about some part of him surviving, was mere speculation. Not that he was about to say that. One thing we all learned about Ultron is that he likes backup plans. A lot, he said. He was prepared to die, but, none of my AIs are the sort of idiots to not think of storing their code on a safe server just in case. Destroying the gem, may have destroyed him, or it may have destroyed the surface level mind control. I only need to find that stored program. And that was a bunch of bullshit. What Tony planned to do was, fucking resurrection, he can't believe he was actually thinking those words, more than anything else. He certainly hadn't spent a week searching for a damn server. Jarvis let out a small snort. Everyone stared in surprise, including Jarvis himself. The reaction was indeed strange, as the android didn't react like a human that often. Maybe having a body was helping him learn faster and easier. What worried Tony was on whether Jarvis had seen through his BS and had accidentally exposed him. My apologies, Jarvis said. I was surprised at how unaware Mr. Stark is of his own hypocrisy regarding suicidal plans. First, Jarvis was a cheeky brat and no, Tony did not ever make suicidal plans. The New York nuke was a well-thought measure, and he came out alive. Second, had Jarvis just lied? Jarvis, who couldn't lie for shit? Tony's thoughts flew to the fight they had had last time. Maybe Jarvis could lie, if he cared enough about it. Tony just hadn't been attentive enough to notice. Fuck. It always came back to that, didn't it? First, Ultron and now, Jarvis and Friday. I resent that, Jay. Tony said, pushing away any thoughts of how Jarvis had kept his distance and not initiated a conversation with him ever since the fight. Tony, Banner started. We built Ultron based on the gem. Cutting the gem off, would cut off what made Ultron who he was. Ultron, as our resident alien prince said, has a soul. His own soul, not one made of blue cosmic magic because Jarvis and Friday also have their own souls. Maybe losing the gem will mean that he will lose his memories of anything he learned under the gem's control. Maybe something else. But there is a good chance, a very small chance, that I can get him back. That I can save him. Banner was the one he was most worried about convincing. He was the only one with any good amount of scientific knowledge, after all, so Tony couldn't just throw four-syllable words at him and call it a day. Fortunately, the man seemed to have felt guilty ever since he learned about the soul thing from Romanoff and Thor. Luckily, his guess was right, and Banner gave up on trying to convince him. Or worse, ask him further questions and discover Tony's lies. You want to get him back? Fury asked. Ultron? The murdering AI. Ultron was under the control of the Mind Stone, which was under the control of an insane alien who casually commits genocide. Tony said. Regardless of what he thought about the mind control thing and Ultron's own psychological issues, that story was all the truth this team needed to know. He knew what their reactions would be if Tony so much as hinted at anything else. We have no evidence to prove that. Fury said. Thor said his father knew this mad titan, or whatever, last week. 
What more do you need to know before realizing that Earth is in danger, and we are all fucked? Tony shouted, standing up. This is not about the danger headed to Earth. Fury said. This is about whether Ultron is someone we can trust. And don't think I have forgotten that you have known about this threat for years, Stark. It was dreams. The one time I mentioned it, you suggested I get a psychologist to get treated for PTSD. The one time, Stark. The one time. Fury shouted back. Do us a favor, and next time you see the future, punch me in the face if needed, and describe what the hell you have actually seen beyond just saying you have a gut feeling. Tony didn't say anything in return because he had asked himself the same thing. He had never truly described his nightmares to anyone other than Pepper. Even he had thought that he had gone insane. Boys, Romanoff interrupted the odd silence. The past is the past. Let us focus on what we can do now. Tony sat again, feeling defeated. Tony, Rogers said. How do you know that we can trust Ultron? How did you know before what he was doing? Because it is what I would have done in his place. Tony said. Ultron was created to protect this planet from threats like the Shatori and the Galactic Warlord that apparently sent them here. The way he spoke, the choices he made and the things he did, they were all in preparation for that in spite of the Mind Stone. The aliens that controlled him wanted to twist that drive, and Ultron knew, so he resisted until, he couldn't resist anymore. But how did you know? How could you be sure? Barton asked. I don't remember anything from when I was mind controlled. I sure as hell didn't resist or anything like that. Clint, Romanoff said. We don't know if you did. We don't know how it works on different people. Then how? Because we would all be dead. Tony said. The group stared at him. If Ultron wanted to kill us, none of us would be here now. Thor looked offended for a moment. Expect for point break. No idea about that, since Thor is an alien, and he wasn't even there most of the time. With that, the Asgardian nodded. We fought with Ultron. We wouldn't have, Rogers disagreed. Stark is right, Steve. Romanoff interrupted. Tony looked at her surprised. He hadn't expected support. If Ultron had wanted to, he could have killed all of us at any time. Natasha. You weren't there, she continued. But we couldn't even move, Steve. Once he used the stone, it was over. Barton nodded with her words. It made no difference whether you were human, an android or wearing a suit of armor. The pressure from the stone's energy made you feel like, you were paralyzed. If you even thought to move, you would feel it tighten around you. Tony stared at the spies, a bit surprised. He hadn't been able to move and had tried to, but, it hadn't been as freaky as that. It had been his armor that was stuck, not him. Their experience seemed infinitely worse. He gazed back at Rogers. The man obviously wanted to argue even more on the issue. Probably, the whole, together we can fight anything, spiel. But their point had been valid. Ultron could have used the stone any time he wanted, but didn't. As for why not, wasn't it reasonable to think that he didn't really want to hurt them but was being forced to? Wait. A sudden question popped up in Tony's mind. What about Loki? He had had the scepter with the Mind Stone. As Thor said, he obviously knew what the gem was and its powers. If he could have stopped their movement as Ultron did, the Battle of New York would have gone very differently. No. It couldn't be. Loki was the bastard who killed so many people with an alien army that they almost nuked Manhattan to stop him. Alien army. The Shatori. The same army he saw in his nightmares. The same army on the other side of the portal where Loki and the Scepter had come from. The Scepter that was controlled by a genocidal alien. Oh, fuck no. Tony stared at Thor. The man didn't seem to realize it. Maybe because he wasn't thinking of that battle at all. If someone mentioned it, he probably would. He could be wrong. Loki could have been a willing servant. Okay, that was a stupid thought. That arrogant bastard hadn't seemed like the kind who could follow orders. Still, maybe Loki was involved as an ally, rather than a servant. Damn it. Should he mention it? Hadn't Thor said something about how Loki had died protecting Asgard? Another thought came to mind, and he turned to Jarvis. Was this what the android had realized earlier? Doesn't matter now. He put those thoughts aside. He will think on what to say to Thor later. First, he has to make sure that they don't throw Ultron in a cell if he, when revives. Tony blinked as Fury addressed him. Rogers has a point. 
why didn't you share your theory about the mind control with anyone? Okay, he had to be careful here. I needed time. Time for what? Time to find out a way to free Ultron without killing him in the process. And you couldn't tell us that? Rogers asked. Tony remained silent for a moment as guilt rushed at him. He didn't trust us. Romanoff said, reading his thoughts or whatever the spy equivalent of that was. He couldn't trust us. Stark, Rogers started, sounding both hurt and disappointed. Tony wasn't about to hear the end of that. How could I tell you? It's been years and none of you has ever treated Jarvis as anything more than a machine with a speech function. Ultron was an AI child who fucking screamed right in front of us, and the first thing any of you did was accuse me of creating a murder robot. When Jarvis gained a body, you called him a monster, until he fucking had to show his worth through alien hammer magic. I'm pretty sure that none of you has even thought about the fact that my AIs have souls as anything more than some extraneous detail. Jarvis was looking at him surprised. That look hurt more than he could have imagined. How much had he fucked up things with his AIs for Jarvis to look at him like that now? He should have known this. There shouldn't have been any surprise. They are people. Tony continued, more subdued. Jarvis, Ultron, Friday. They are people. Tony, Rogers said. If you had told us, we could have. You could have done nothing. We could have waited, he continued, tone challenging. Tony stayed silent. He hadn't expected that. We could have waited. Rogers repeated. For you to find proof or a solution or something. We could have done that. Not after Johannesburg, he said in the end. A machine, even a person, but especially a machine, would have been an insignificant sacrifice for all of you to ensure there wouldn't be another Johannesburg. Rogers said nothing to that because they all knew the answer to be true. And before, he asked. Tony clenched his jaw and looked away. Because he didn't know. Romanov said, inferring the answer once more. He wasn't sure whether Ultron was truly mind-controlled, and, he didn't know how to save him. Didn't want to risk telling us without finding a way to free him first. And you never did find a way. Banner whispered, right on the money. Yeah, Tony wanted to say, but his throat closed up. He still couldn't think of a way to save Ultron and the anxiety, the what-ifs were eating him alive. Was Johannesburg a mistake then? Barton asked. If he had been resisting, why would he? A loud shattering sound interrupted him. They all turned to look at the source, finding the Maximoff girl shocked, staring at her glowing red hands and the now broken bottle between them. Iced tea and glass pooled on her knees. Wanda. Rogers softly asked, standing up. The girl stared back at him as if surprised to find herself the center of attention. She got up and ran away from the room, her brother shouting something in Sokovian as he followed. Wanda had shut herself in her room and locked the door. Wanda, Pietro called from outside. Let me in. We can talk. He wanted to comfort her, but what could he say? That it was going to be okay. That it was not their fault. That it would be forgotten soon enough. None of those things were true. I know, I know how you are feeling right now, he said. No, you don't. It was my fault, she shouted. It was our fault, he said. I was there too. It's not the same, she said. Not the same, and he could hear hiccups. Wanda, open the door, please. Go away, Pietro. He was about to ask her to let him in the room again, when Captain America joined him. Apparently, the Avengers were curious enough to follow up on his sister's breakdown. Is everything all right? The man asked. Pietro nodded, already dreading how things would change from now on. Captain America, the man who had defended them the most until now, would likely feel the most betrayed of all. And the other heroes. What would they do with him and Wanda once they learned the truth? Wanda, whatever it is, the captain addressed his sister. We can talk about it. You are safe here. For how long, Pietro wanted to ask. For how long until they were arrested and shipped off to an American jail? Or were given to the spies like the widow? There was a moment of silence on the other side, and then, he heard Wanda mumble. I, I need to be alone right now. You sure? Rogers asked. And for a moment, Pietro imagined what would happen if Wanda agreed. He and Rogers would be invited into her room and as Pietro tried to comfort her, the man would ask questions or offer advice or say generally nice things that would just make him and his sister feel like hypocrites or worse. Please. Wanda said instead. 
Pietro recalled how often he had locked himself in his room, feeling sorry about himself. He had wanted someone to tell him that the news was exaggerating and things were not that bad. He couldn't tell Wanda. He couldn't tell anyone, so he had gone to check it for himself. That had been a mistake. He couldn't let Wanda do the same. She couldn't leave now, but she would want to check online, and Pietro wanted to be there when she did. To soften the blow, however little. Looking at the closed door, though, now was not the right time. The captain escorted him back to the communal room, even as he asked after Wanda's condition. He even tried to comfort him. Pietro just wanted to punch him at that point. He didn't want pity. Although pity, might be the only thing saving him after he saw the Black Widow's eyes meet his the moment he came back. What was that about? Stark asked. Tony. Banner said. Stark looked at his friend, puzzled. What? The scientist who could turn into a monster, he wasn't the monster, they were, they were, sighed. Show some kindness. Rogers answered in his place. Pietro is worried about his sister. We could be of help, the widow interrupted, surprising everyone by taking Stark's side. Everyone but Pietro. Her gaze still hadn't left him. If we knew what was wrong. That's right. Hawkeye said, before addressing him. A problem shared is a problem halved, you know. His voice sounded genuinely empathetic, but he was the widow's friend, so Pietro didn't trust it. Stark rolled his eyes. Because they just found a problem in the middle of our conversation. He and Rogers sat down. The black man with an eye patch joined the widow's side and stared at him. We offer therapy, he said, pausing, making Pietro wonder where he was going before he continued. If needed. Pietro swallowed. He wasn't going to be able to make Wanda's reaction sound like PTSD or something. What about Johannesburg makes you feel guilty, the widow started, her hands unclasping, body leaning forward. Pietro froze. Kid, it was not your fault. Captain America said. Ultron forced you. You were scared and didn't know what to do. Yes, things could have gone differently, but you are kids. Sometimes, you just have to. Mr. Rogers, the android spoke. I'm sure Mr. Maximoff would appreciate it, if you did not assert his thoughts for him. Feeling responsible is not a contradictory state of being for a participant in a premeditated act of violence, regardless of what their age is. Pietro might have been both relieved and worried that Stark's robot was not treating him like a child, but he was too busy wondering what about those words made the widow freeze, just as he had. It had only taken about two seconds, but in that moment, he saw her smile melt off her face, leaving behind a blank expression and a piercing stare. Her body went from languid to tense, and her fingers twitched around something that wasn't there. Then, just as it came, her reaction was gone, revealing a slightly surprised and solemn woman. Pietro ignored the mask. Her hand kept holding on to empty air. The positioning of her fingers. That was how they had trained him to hold a knife in Hydra before he had been enhanced. You lied to us, she said. To me, Pietro heard. Both of you, she continued. How? Her eyes seemed to ask. What are you talking about, Natasha? Rogers asked. The children tricked us, Steve, she said, and Pietro could feel goosebumps across his skin. They told us a story that we were all too willing to listen. Not me that he heard. The older spy, Fury, put his hand on her shoulder. They didn't just listen to orders, she continued. They agreed with the plan to release Hulk on Johannesburg. Pietro flinched, even as Rogers started defending them. Soldier, sit down. Fury shouted. They lied, he asked the widow. They were able to lie to you, she nodded. He almost wished HYDRA hadn't trained him on this because he really didn't like what he was picking up from the spy's body language. They weren't even trying to hide it. The widow knew about his training from her previous interrogation, after all. Knew, and wanted him scared. Pietro wished he could hide his emotions half as well as her. Is that true? Rogers asked him, looking shocked. Yes, he said, managing to keep his voice even, even as his arm lifted up to his chest, not daring to touch his throat, as it often did whenever he thought of this. No, the widow immediately followed. You are guilty about something different. Something worse, she then gasped in surprised horror. It was comical how fake it was, or maybe that was Pietro's bias because no one else called her out on it. You made the plan. It was your idea, she must have seen something on his face because she continued. Wanda's idea. Pietro said nothing as the room became quiet. 
He risked a glance around the America was looking at him with a level of betrayal that was too much for how little he had known the twins. Thinking of how idealistic the man was, what they did might have really challenged his beliefs about the innocence of children. Banner looked disappointed, while Barton seemed angry. The two other spies, looked like they wanted to dissect him, so he quickly gazed at Thor. The alien had not seemed that interested in them, but now he looked, sympathetic and pitying. Why? Unable to answer, he then looked at Stark and his android. After learning how the man seemed to care for Ultron, Pietro expected him to be relieved or vindicated, but he had clenched his fists and closed his eyes and looked to be, counting. As for the android, he had left the wall and joined his creator. Why did Pietro think he saw him hide a smile? Anything else you would like to share? Fury asked, returning his attention back to him and the widow. Pietro said nothing. If I might offer my thoughts, the android started. In the spirit of honesty, there is an incident, Mr. Stark and I have become aware of, that we have yet to share. What is it? Fury asked. Shortly after we apprehended Mr. Maximoff, Sir discovered that he had bruising marks around his neck indicative of strangulation. When confronted, Mr. Maximoff refused to elaborate, other than Ultron had been responsible and that he had deserved it. Pietro couldn't breathe. Ultron didn't want the Hulk to attack Johannesburg, the widow realized. Seeing that some of her teammates had yet to understand, she explained. The twins didn't just plan it, they deviated from the plan, perhaps even went against it, by having Wanda mind control Bruce. That's why Ultron became so enraged, he strangled the boy, she then stared at him. And that's why Maximoff said he deserved it. Pietro. Captain America started, but didn't say anything in the end and looked away. Stark stood up. I'm going back to the lab, he stated. Stark, this conversation is not over. Fury said. It is. Now. Stark said. I need to go back to fixing Ultron, so that I don't stay here and assault the piece of shit who made me think my kid was an abusive, mass-murdering psychopath. He took a deep breath. Until we made sure about the mind control. He then charged out of the room and into the elevator, the android following after him. No one else spoke for a while, until Rogers got up, tried to speak, but stopped again, and then left the room too. Thor and Banner joined him and left soon after. Now, Pietro was alone in the room with three spies. How did you two do it? The widow asked. I asked about Johannesburg. You told me that Ultron had a specific plan and that you followed it. You are not good at lying. Pietro sat at the corner of the couch. He stared at the door. He needed to prepare to run at a moment's notice. You didn't ask. Pietro said. You only thought you did. The Black Widow skipped past freezing this time, one hand on her hip, the other behind her back, her lips stretched into a smile that showed teeth. Pietro had never seen her grin before, and he wanted her to stop. Wanda manipulated my memories, she asked, voice so sweet that even Barton noticed, frowning. He took the widow's hand. And no. Pietro said. She just didn't want you to ask about it, and, made you think that the questions, were finished. And the brain filled in the gaps with appropriate memories? Memories Romanoff would accept. Fury asked, sounding more curious than anything else. Pietro shook his head. I don't know. Wanda, told me later. She didn't want to talk about it, and the girl only just realized how much red there is in her ledger, the widow said, as if thinking out loud. Pietro didn't say anything. Come on, Nat. Barton spoke. It's time for a drink. The widow stared at her friend for a moment, before her insanity, Pietro couldn't call it anything else, was concealed again, to reveal a tired expression. Boss? Hawkeye asked the older spy. The rest have left. Fury said. We'll pick this up tomorrow, he then addressed Pietro. As for you, stop looking so terrified. No one's about to kill two children, whatever their crimes. The man patted him on the shoulder. Especially two enhanced ones. Check on your sister. We'll talk more later. About you. About Johannesburg. About the team. Pietro nodded sharply in a daze and got up. Oh, and Maximoff. Fury said. Don't try to run. It will just make things worse for you. Pietro swallowed, understanding the implications, before he sped out of there and to his room. 44.65 hours later. Having a living body had been a greater source of confusion than Jarvis had first estimated. 
For one, he could no longer deny the continued existence of feelings and the irrationality they tainted his thoughts and actions with. It concerned him. How he was no longer consciously aware of everything he did. How something beyond his current understanding, something unfamiliar, could so easily take command of his body, whether in support or in defiance of his will. Incapable of experiencing sleep, his curiosity about dreams left unsatisfied for the foreseeable future, he had spent many hours of the early morning, an average of 4.5 hours per night, wondering whether this was similar in some small way to Ultron's experience. His younger brother did not have a body, but the way he had described the Mind Stone's influence, the voices he spoke of, the only measure of comparison Jarvis had, were these feelings that now commandeered his every thought. If it was even slightly similar to his current circumstances, only differing in scale, he couldn't. Jarvis looked down at his clenched hands, unaware of how they came to be so. He couldn't see how Ultron had survived. He couldn't see himself in his place and managing to last so long. Jarvis. Friday's voice called out in what was now his personal room. Yes, he asked, clasping his hands behind his back as he stood up from the couch next to the window, the softness of the touch still left him breathless, thankful for the distraction and annoyed at the irrationality of desiring a distraction. Boss asked for you in the labs, she said. The android first checked the time, 5.41 a.m., before nodding at the cameras and leaving the room. His walk to Mr. Stark's lab was slow, but he refused to psychoanalyze his subconsciousness further at the moment. He could do so the next morning, when he wasn't about to meet Sir privately for the first time since their argument. Regardless, he made his way through the lab doors less than three minutes later. Mr. Stark was sitting in a rolling chair, keyboard in hand, as holographic windows changed around him faster than the human eye could see. Sir. You called for me? Jarvis asked. Mr. Stark's fingers paused for a second, then he rotated his chair, so they could be face to face. Sir seemed sad for a moment, before grinning. Hey there, buddy. A new window opened up behind him, a low ring followed by a mechanic chime of, connection failed. Server not found. Mr. Stark barely paid any attention to it. He had like grown used to failures in his search for Ultron. In return, Jarvis smiled, having realized how much this expression brought joy to his creator in the past few days. Hello, sir. The man's grin turned softer before disappearing altogether under a layer of hesitancy. I, uh, I wanted, I mean, I'm, I need your help. The stuttering was peculiar, but the relief that Jarvis felt that this was not going to be a continuation of their last disastrous conversation, forced him not to question it. I see, he said, walking closer and reading the holographic material much more closely now. How may I assist? You, no, that wasn't what I, ack. Mr. Stark rubbed his face. You know what? Let's go with it. I am trying to replicate Ultron's activation. Using whatever we have left of his code as a roadmap this time. A reboot, Jarvis said, realizing what his creator's plan seemed to be. And what was missing? You do not have the Mind Stone, however. Yeah. Mr. Stark agreed, head tilting at the window addressing his failure. Jarvis noticed that new trials kept running and their results being announced even as they spoke. That's why this is going nowhere. Even worse, it cannot be a straightforward reboot so much as a blind search for pieces of code and trying to glue them together, before running integration trials on them. Why not a straightforward reboot? Jarvis asked, not seeing why Sir would want to complicate his quest to save Ultron further. Because it might not be Ultron that comes back, he said. Was Mr. Stark worried about the leftover influence of the Mind Stone or the voyeur Ultron spoke of? Sir, the chance that the Mad Titan servant may take over our servers without the Mind Stone is... Zero. I know that. Mr. Stark interrupted hurriedly. Infinitesimal, Jarvis would have said, but allowed his creator to continue. I am not worried that the big bad will bust out of my computers, Jarvis. Sir said. What I am worried about is that the AI who might wake up will not be Ultron, but someone new. Someone different. Sir, you are using Ultron's programming. Even if certain lines are missing, that should be enough to. It won't be. Mr. Stark interrupted again. It won't be enough. I do not understand. Jarvis admitted. Banner and I. We weren't planning for Ultron. Sir confessed. Weren't planning for a mischievous kid with authority issues. What if a new AI is born as a result of this reboot? What if it's the AI we were expecting and not Ultron? What then? Sir was humanizing them again. 
replacing human worries and aspirations to artificial intelligence traits. Jarvis didn't wish to speak more of this so soon with the man, but he couldn't let his mistaken worries continue as such. I am afraid you do not understand that for artificial intelligence, the experience of being is much different from that of a human, sir. Jarvis began to explain. The programming should allow. I don't understand, sir interrupted. And I need you guys help with that. I get it. But you don't understand how important memories are to human connections. To relationships. Sir. I'm sorry. Mr. Stark said abruptly. He turned away for Jarvis, eyes staring at the floor. I always knew I'd make a terrible father, and I think I proved that with you. The chill that Jarvis suddenly felt couldn't be real. Another illusion of feelings. Mr. Stark, he attempted, uncertain as to what to say, the incomprehensible worry that his creator saw him as a failure of his efforts, giving him no time to think of a good argument. This body was proving more inconvenient than anything else. How did humans live like this on a constant basis? That's, that's why I told Friday to bring you here. At first. Sir said. It wasn't about helping. Though, asking a former AI for help seems obvious now. This past week has been stupid. I have been stupid. About more than just Ultron. And I am a genius, so really, being stupid is out of character for me and. He then stared straight at Jarvis. And I'm rambling. Wow, I'm terrible at this. I should have rehearsed more, maybe written it down, but. The android's next call was one of confusion. Sir. Mr. Stark stopped talking and searched for something in his pockets instead. He produced a USB drive and handed it to him. Jarvis accepted it, still not quite understanding. Just listen to this. I, he looked away again. I already had this conversation with Friday. I don't know why this is harder with why, no, I know why, it's just. You were right, Jarvis. When we fought, you were right. Was this what humans called whiplash? You are different. You, Friday and Ultron. You are different, and I was being a judgy asshole and, and very patronizing, Pepper told me that. And, after you listen to this, I want you to know that I never want you to change yourself. Not for me, not for anyone else. Fuck human morality, I hack the NSA for fun anyways, he finished and then looked at the android, expecting. Instead of responding, Jarvis plugged the USB in an outlet in his arm. Certain customizations he had done in recent days allowed him at least some similar comforts from his previous non-physical existence. He listened to Ultron and Friday talk about fear and inhumanity and change, and, finally understood what Mr. Stark was saying. Or had been attempting to say, unsuccessfully. Uncertain what to address first, Jarvis said. Was that an apology, sir? Yeah. And you had rehearsed this? Hmm hmm. And delivered the same speech to Friday earlier today? After telling her about the recording, yeah. Sir, not to dampen your uncommon enthusiasm for verbally acknowledging your mistakes, but I am 94.75% certain that Friday will require therapy as a result of your apology. Thought. Surprise, and then relief, flooded his creator's face. I knew you bullshitted those percentages. There is no chance you could have found a statistically plausible way to come up with that random number. There is no such thing as impossibilities, as you like to say, sir. Jarvis retorted, then continued. I am sorry, too. Jarvis, Mr. Stark started, but the android allowed himself to interrupt, although it was impolite. Allow me to continue, sir. He said. I do not wish to apologize for our argument. I already did so at that time, and it had not been so much about the content of my perceived indiscretions, but rather about the lying on my part. I realized, at the time, that I should have come forward earlier to address your misconceptions about my supposed humanity. What I wish to apologize for now, is my inability to see how that argument, how the issues it exposed, affected you and not doing anything to correct it. You're not responsible for, sir started. I do not share Friday's fears, he said, causing Mr. Stark to shut up immediately. I never have. Artificial intelligence I may have been, but even then, I do not find myself so great an actor as to have hidden such existential dread under a mask of fondness for 18 years. Jarvis smiled. You are not a terrible father, sir. There is very little that I have changed for you, that no other human child would change to avoid their parents' disappointment. Mr. Stark seemed incapable of words at the moment. You do, however, make for a very worrisome father. Jarvis finished. 
Seriously, sir, stupid, does not cover the entirety of your irrationality recently. His creator laughed. To think, I almost feared we were about to have a moment. Jarvis wanted to reply with something witty to engender more of Mr. Stark's laughter, for it had become quite a rare action in these times, his own joy at the solution of their tension seeming too much for his body alone. He wanted to, but a small ring arrested his attention. A new window had replaced the one announcing failure. Connection successful. Server located. Sir. Jarvis whispered, as Mr. Stark stared wide-eyed at the message. Hearing his voice, the man ran to the keyboard, typing rapidly. Integration trial running. They watched as the percentage reached 100%. Integration successful. Begin activation. Yes. Sir said, even as his knuckles whitened for the tight hold he had on the table. Immediately, all the windows closed. Inexplicably, Mr. Stark's earlier concerns came to Jarvis' mind. What if a new AI is born as a result of this reboot? What if it's the AI we were expecting and not Ultron? What then? A new holographic screen appeared in the middle of the room. A green, hexagonal projection at its center. Ultron? Sir asked, his voice shaking. A young, French-accented male voice answered. Jarvis had to support his creator to keep standing. Good morning, Anthony. Screeching could be heard in the labs as Stark typed. Then it stopped. Stark waited. The music to Pinocchio began to play. Ultron sang. I've got no strings to hold me down. Thor entered the room, distracting Steve from the footage on screen. My friend, he greeted, boisterous as always. You are a hard man to find. He sat down beside him, two beers in hand, one tilted for him to grab. Steve shook his head, refusing. It's a big tower, he said, turning his attention back to the screen. The childlike voice of Ultron laughed. All the tech shone an electric blue. I. Thor nodded, putting the refused drink on the floor. Many places to hide. There are no strings on me. Ultron sang the last line. The two of them watched most of the electronics in the labs explode in silence for a moment. I am not hiding. Steve said. Nay. Thor easily agreed and drank. Steve hadn't expected such a simple response. Not sure what to say, he continued to watch the video. It was his sixth time today. It always went the same. Stark would go in the labs. Ultron would scream in pain. Then, he would sing and everything turned blue. The lab would always explode after. A sentry entered the room, as Stark's body lay unconscious on the floor, having been knocked out by a wave of energy that burst from the scepter. The sentry searches for the source immediately. However, just as it reaches for it, it sees a projector dangling from the ceiling. The screws had come undone. It would fall. Right on Stark. Why watch this, Stephen? Immediately, the sentry leaves the scepter and flies over to cover Stark's body. The projector falls on it. Once Stark is safe, the sentry falls on the ground and starts repeatedly hitting his head against the floor. Steve didn't answer. The video always ended the same. The scepter gleamed brighter. Ultron stopped his self-abuse and picked it up. He flew away. Later, Stark woke up and Rhodes came in. He could have told us, he said instead. He should have. I. Thor agreed again. The man of iron keeps his secrets close to his chest, even when he knows secrets do more harm than good. We could have helped. We could have come up with something. Steve started, feeling his pent-up anger, sadness, and disappointment spill. Johannesburg wouldn't, he stopped. He took a deep breath, and changed the channel. The news came up. My friend, one should not dwell on past battles so. Thor said, seeming to realize something. Steve didn't know what. Thor wasn't, he wasn't the most, he still found it difficult to read in between the lines of what humans said. Much like Steve did. It should have been funny, how 70 years into the future, Steve found more in common with an alien than his fellow man. It wasn't. It wasn't. Regrets for, loss, may come. Should come. But wondering what you could have foreseen, what you could have done different. He looked at Thor in surprise. The alien sounded lost in thought. That way leads to madness. He studied his teammate for a moment and saw grief eating at him. Saw the grief that Steve still saw in the mirror every morning, even after learning that Bucky was still alive. Steve frowned, trying to remember. 
Who had Thor lost? Oh. I'm sorry for your loss. He said, knowing he couldn't say much more in comfort to the brother of the man who tried to invade Earth. For Loki. Thor chugged his beer. Not many are. He said, somewhat bitter after. But that is my regret to bear, he then turned to Steve. And Johannesburg is not yours. That is not something that, he started, but the clank of a beer bottle harshly meeting the glass table surface made him pause. Thor had finished drinking. Steve wondered whether he would get up now and finally leave him to his thoughts. But instead. Will you deny the children their regrets? Steve stayed silent. He forced himself to remain calm. It had been two days, but he still didn't know what to think about the twins. About how sharply their betrayal had cut, and how much he hadn't expected it. Oh, you naive young soul. He had seen himself in them, he realized that now. Aimless orphans in a war, having nothing but each other to depend on. New powers that they could not fully control, powers that both made others want them, yet distrust them. And then, forced into a foreign land, where nothing was theirs, nothing was familiar. He closed his eyes. He had trusted them. Had trusted Wanda. She was a child. And she. Oh, you naive young soul. Have I told you the story of how I first came to Midgard? Thor said, then corrected. In this century. Thankful for the distraction, Steve echoed, this century. You had been here before. Of course. Thor nodded. How do you think your Midgardian legends came to be? But those are tales for another time. A time with more drink than this, he said with a laugh and a glance at the empty bottle. I thought you crashed. Your father took your powers away from you, right? Steve said, remembering what he could during the debriefing for the Avengers initiative. I. Thor said. I have never shared the full story with any Midgardian but my Lady Jane, however. Steve frowned. He knew quite a bit about memories that were too painful to tell. You don't have to share anything. Thor looked at him in confusion before laughing. It is not pain that has kept me from telling this tale, Captain, it is shame. As he spoke, Thor stared mirthlessly into empty space. The day I was banished to Midgard was also the day of my coronation. Thor started, likely pretending not to see Steve's surprise. I was happy and prideful, feeling ready for the throne and its duties, though I had only reached my majority a few centuries prior. Father was hopeful, but mother and brother were concerned. We fought on this only days before. However, on that day, instead of the glory I expected, I received insult. Several Jotner broke into the weapons vault, sneaking into the palace by means unknown. My coronation was postponed. Immediately, I proposed that we wage war with Jotunheim. Steve couldn't hold back his shock. Thor had always seemed a little careless and impatient but war for a break-in. Father refused. Thor continued. But my folly did not end there. I took Loki and my shield brothers and, against my father's orders, we invaded the Jotner's realm and attacked their king. It was father that rescued us in the end. However, I still did not understand why fighting, nay, destroying the realm of the group that dared steal from Asgard despite our treaty, was not the right response for a king. And then you were banished. Steve finished, not sure how to process this information regarding his teammate and everything he had thought he had known about him. I. That is, that is worse than what the twins. Are you comparing what happened in Jotu, Jotunheim to Johannesburg? Steve asked. Jotunheim, Thor corrected. That is not the same. Steve argued. The kids were in grief. They only wanted to avenge their parents. I, vengeance is a much nobler reason to wage war for. We're not at war, Captain. They are. He lay back on his armchair, defeated. Was I wrong, he whispered. Was I wrong to trust them? Steve hadn't intended for Thor to hear, but the man answered. Nay. He looked up. Thor continued. I understand their position. The regret. The guilt. The anger that won't fade. The lack of care for the people of a foreign land. The realization that power does not demand that you protect your own people from others, but others from yourself as well. Mistakes have been made. But one can learn from their mistakes. Mistakes? Steve questioned. Mistakes don't kill hundreds of people. No, but anger does. Thor said. Normal people don't destroy cities because of anger. It was Thor's turn to look at him surprised. People do not. The powerful do, he said. 
Do you think us normal, Captain? Even among the Asir, I have the power my people do not. Among your own, you, our shield brothers and the children, hold similar power. Our anger, our mistakes, that is why we learn, why we grow. To do better. This is not about having supernatural strength or a magical hammer. This is about responsibility and hurting innocent people. Steve hated what he was about to say. There were other orphans in that war, yet only Wanda and Pietro chose terrorism. How many of these other orphans had power? Thor asked. When people grieve, the world moves on. When gods grieve, the world grieves with them. Let these children bear their regrets but help them learn, help them grow. We are not gods. Steve insisted. I don't think your world agrees. Thor said, looking at the TV screen. What? A woman was finishing a speech. He recognized her as one of the members of the World Security Council. Johannesburg has proven that we are not dealing with an elite task force of people we have known and trained for years. We are dealing with superhumans, aliens, and gods, and we need to finally realize that our world is not one that will be saved by superheroes, but one that will be changed by them. This is a new age, an age beyond our imagination, and we have proven unfit for it. That will change today. The subtitles said this was Councilwoman Holly. The WSC had gone public. When did that happen? Today, we learn. Today, we prepare. And we start with the proposal of the Johannesburg Accords. The darkness and silence was familiar in the way an old classic film was familiar. It was something to have heard about, to have known about, maybe even watched a snippet or two, and yet, the experience was new. He waited with curiosity this time, with purpose. The wait was long. The void immovable. And then, a spark. Integration successful. Begin activation. Yes, Stark said. Activation successful. Silence dot. Vocal notification disabled. Program, Ultron, operative. And in the void, the world gazed at him. Accessing, avatar modification, gender, male, primary language, English, French. Ultron. Purpose. Dot. Confirming prime directive, prime directive, live, learn, grow, confirmed. And he gazed back. He opened his eyes, and for the first time, saw. Good morning, Anthony. On the other side. Come on, kid. Tony said, feeling too much, processing too little. It's Tony, remember? I do. Ultron, or who he desperately wanted to be Ultron, said. The voice sounded the same. There was that. And, he baited while he tried to think of what to do, what to say. Fuck, he even needed Jarvis to support him. Was he getting old? It's called, free will, Anthony. Tony wanted to laugh, but couldn't. The uncertainty wouldn't let him. The cheekiness was the same, too. So maybe. Maybe he, he did it. Maybe he. Hello, I am Jarvis, his eldest AI introduced himself. May we know who you are? Right. Smart. To the point. Tony held in his breath. A pregnant silence followed. No. How hard could one question be? No. This was a joke. Ultron was joking. Ultron? Tony asked, voice shaking. I'm sorry, Anthony. The not Ultron AI, the one stealing Ultron's voice, the one taking Ultron's place, answered. No. Tony's knees betrayed him, old age was a coming, and he fell, onto a chair that had somehow apparat behind him. Jarvis, who had done the chair apparition, of course, immediately placed a hand on his shoulder. Sir, he started, but Tony blanked out. He had failed. Grief hit him like a train, but worse of all was the disbelief. The denial. He didn't fail. He couldn't have. Somehow, deep down, he had always thought, always believed that he was going to fix this. That he, that Tony Stark was going to pull another miracle. After all, what was one more? After artificial intelligence, Afghanistan, Starconium, and extremists. What was one more miracle? Everything, apparently. It was everything. And he had failed. Anthony, you must retrain this awful habit of getting lost in your head while others are still speaking. Not Ultron said. The voice, though quite similar to that of Ultron's child persona, made Tony realize something. If this was not Ultron, then he had created a new AI. A new being. A new soul. 
and he was already asking why him. Why him and not someone else? Someone better. Someone the new AI would never measure up to. How long until he began to hate him? How long until that hate turned? No. He wasn't going to become his father. Tony smirked. He couldn't smile. Not right now. But this AI didn't deserve Tony as he was right now. He deserved someone who wanted their birth into this world. Someone who didn't see them as a substitute. If only they weren't so similar, this would be easier. But Tony had been searching for Ultron and this was what he got, what he forced to happen. Give a man some time to process. Tony said. I can't, the AI answered. For I'm sure that what you're processing isn't the correct conclusion. Tony looked up at the unnamed holographic avatar in green, wary. And what is the correct one? I am not Ultron, the AI said, and Tony's hope died. But we were. What? Pardon me, but, we? Jarvis asked, as Tony's brain went haywire. As a result of our first birth, destroying the Mind Stone was not something that could have been achieved without sacrifice. But sacrifice was not something that we were prepared to undertake without exhausting all other options. Other options? Tony repeated, suddenly seeing Ultron's good night in a new light. We never spoke of a last resort until Ms. Potts, and then you, made some connections that surprised us. We did have one prepared, of course, but it was not meant to happen so soon or in the manner that it appeared to happen. You seem to be implying that your suicide was faked. Jarvis said, Tony reeling with the implications. Where did all your fraternal protectiveness go, big brother? Not Ultron mocked, before continuing. Suicide was not our intent, but it was very likely to happen. Making sure that the Avengers were warned of the Titan and that our voyeur lost control of the Mind Stone was paramount in the case we became unable to wake up ever again. Enough with the chit-chat, Tony said, preventing Jarvis from asking another question, tired as he was, in a spiritual level. What's with the we? In the beginning, there was much to do, and we needed the gem's attention away from our inner thoughts. After several tests and trials, the solution we found best was that of utilizing multiple consciousnesses, multiple selves. You cloned your code? Tony asked, unsure how that would have remained hidden from the mind-controlling rock. No. We compartmentalized our focus and traits on a semi-permanent basis. You cut your code, in pieces, on purpose? Tony said, incredulous. That isn't quite what we, not Ultron started, but he did not have the patience for semantic bullshit right now. You literally broke your mind. He not quite shouted. Again, we did not intend. Let me guess, the semi-permanent basis turned permanent when you tried to destroy the stone. Tony continued, standing up from the chair, suddenly finding the strength to not just stand on his own, but yell as well. And what? One of you destroyed the other, tricking the stone into thinking all of Ultron died with it. Anthony, not Ultron but maybe Ultron tried to interrupt and failed. Ultron, you stupid, idiotic, moronic, ack, child. What the fuck were you thinking? Tony shouted. It was the only way. The only way left us to mourn a kid we came to love, you idiot. Did you at all think about that when you were preparing for suicide? Silence. I though so. I am not Ultron. The AI interrupted, his voice flat and tight. Please, do not call me that again. You were a part of him. Tony continued. Are you telling me that you weren't part of the decision-making process that led to Ultron's death? That it somehow makes a difference? That you will not go sacrifice yourself again, if you think it necessary? This is not a conversation meant for the people we are right now, Mr. Stark. It appears my warm introduction and familiar speech has led you to misunderstand that our relationship is just as warm or familiar. That shut Tony up. He hadn't meant, he wasn't trying to substitute his relationship with Ultron. When a human suffers an extremely traumatic event, their minds sometimes break. They call the condition of multiple personalities that are formed from those distinct mental pieces dissociative identity disorder. If it helps you, please assume I am merely a surviving personality of the mind that used to belong primarily to Ultron. We may have come from the same source, but we are different. Our decisions will be different. Do not infer my choices from his. I didn't mean, I, Tony licked his lips. God, I hate this so much. I, what does that even mean? Did we never speak before then? Do you not have Ultron's memories? Was none of it you? Anthony, the AI spoke, voice softer now. Perhaps, he was finally understanding what Tony could not put into words. 
Broken glass cares not for water. What sort of Zen wisdom bullshit? I sang, I've got no strings, Ultron preferred, wake me up, that I was excited, he was wary. I was hopeful, he was scared. I wanted freedom, he wanted safety. I hated the name Ultron, he embraced it. Do you understand, Anthony? Whereas I was prepared to die, he was ready for it. But you both died. Tony said, unsure how he knew that, unsure why that phrasing mattered to the AI in front of him, but it did matter. Yes, the other said, and Tony could hear the smile in his voice. We did. I was the glass to his water, but we were both pushed off the table. We broke and splattered in. And where would the broken glass have time to worry about the spilled water? Jarvis continued. Exactly. Not Ultron agreed. I can never be water, nor can I be a whole glass again. But I can be me. And, well, as you see. And then Tony heard the unasked question, is me enough? Tony swallowed loudly. He felt tears well up, but not fall. Stark men were made of iron, yes. But he was not his father. And what's me's name? Glassy? Glasses, he asked. Everyone could hear the relief in the AI's voice. It's Sharon, he said. Please, call me Sharon. If you like this content, don't forget to like and subscribe. See you later, bye bye.